that the, this meeting is now being recorded. Recording has started, Chair. Thank you. The recording has started. Um, Lynn, if we could do the seventh, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. When you hear your name, can you confirm your attendance, please? We have an apology this morning from Councillor Jones, Councillor Cogley. Here. Councillor Richardson. Present. Councillor Canning. Present, thanks. Councillor Mabin. Councillor Clark. Councillor Lennox. Councillor Lennox, I can see you, but I think you froze. Can you hear us, Councillor Lennox? Come back to him. Councillor Kyle. Present. Councillor Hogg. Yes, I'm here, thanks. Councillor Watts. Uh, morning, Lynn, I'm here. Thank you. And we have an apology from Councillor Stewart. Thank you. Yes, he had a uh, logged off. I think he's trying to get back uh, on. Keep an eye out for him. Yeah. Okay. okay well, keep, keep an eye out for for Councillor Lennox. Thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest? Can't see any. No, right. OK, thank you very much. So item number two is the previous minutes. Um, are there any matters that anybody would like to raise, please? I can't see any. I can't see any online. None from the room. Um, can we approve these minutes then, please? Yep. Thank you. That's approved. Yeah. So if we move on to item three, please, which is the duty of candor, if uh, I could hand over to you then, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair and members. The purpose of the report is to remit to Governance and Scrutiny Committee the annual reports and incidents which meet the duty of candour for registered daycare of children's services and housing support services for the period the 1st of April 2023 to the 31st of March 2024. Recommendations are set out at paragraph two and committee is asked to note that the duty of candour applies to registered daycare of children's services and housing support services. Note that there is no instance to which the duty applies, a short annual report is still required. Note the annual reports for duty of candour in relation to daycare of children's services and housing support services at appendix one and two respectively and otherwise note the contents of the report. Paragraphs 3 to 9 set out the background in relation to the duty of candour, the organisational duty of candour provisions of the Health, Tobacco, Nicotine etc and Care Scotland Act 2016 and the duty of candour procedure Scotland regulations 2018 set out the procedure that organisations providing health services, care services and social work services in Scotland are required by law to follow when there has been an unintended or unexpected incident that results in death, a permanent lessening of bodily, sensory, motor motor, physiologic or intellectual functions or harm not being severe harm. Members will note that the duty applies to all registered health, social work and care services with the exclusion of childminders to be open and honest with patients or service users or their families when an unexpected incident of the nature set out in paragraph 3 occurs. However, the duty will only apply when the organisation is notified by a healthcare professional that in the professional's reasonable opinion such an incident has occurred. The duty does not apply where the incident was minor in nature or a near miss. However, it is good practice to learn from all incidents that occur. <clears throat> Every year, the Care Inspectorate asks all registered services to complete an annual return. This provides the Care Inspectorate with important information that helps inform it to plan and carry out inspections. The Care Inspectorate annual return now includes a question asking registered services if they have published a duty of candor report. There is also a question included in the Care Inspectorate notification e-forms, which, oh, which asks organisations if they have been notified of an incident which has triggered the duty of candor. Even if there are no incidents to which the duty applies, a short annual report is still required. <clears throat> Paragraphs 10 to 13 sets out the purpose and content of the report duty of candor report and makes recommendations for the layout and structure of the report. The primary purposes of the report are directed at supported learning rather than merely collecting quantitative information, to provide public assurance that the duty of candor is being embedded within the services to which it applies, to encourage responsible persons to self-reflect on how the duty is being embedded and how the quality of operation can be continually improved, 
and to contribute to the care inspectorate, healthcare improvement Scotland and the Scottish Government's wide evidence base about the provision of social care and health services. Annual reports for daycare of children's services and house and support services are attached to Appendix 1 and 2 and members will note that there are no reportable incidents. Paragraphs 14 to 22 set out any implications in connection with the report and I would draw members' attention to paragraph 20 and the risk implications and failure to comply with the statutory duties which requires organisations to carry out their duty of candour may result in prosecution and damage to the reputation of the organisation. To conclude, this is a very positive report which sets out the Council's compliance with the duty of candour in relation to house and support and daycare of children's services with no incidents recorded which meet the threshold for reporting under the duty of candour. That concludes the report, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's, it's, it's excellent that um, there is a, a nil report on this one. Obviously, we still have to go through the procedure, but it is excellent that that's a nil report. So thank you for that. I'll open that up to the floor. Does anybody wish to ask or raise uh, any matter? No? No, anything online? Mentioned, no. no, okay. All right, thank you very much. Well, I'll refer you to the recommendations uh, at paragraph two, and um, I think we've agreed all of those are approved. So thank you very much. Lisa, you're most welcome to stay if you want to, but we do understand if, um, if you wish to leave. Jamie, I think you're staying anyway. Yeah, thank you. So we will move on now to item four which is the progress report on the East Ayrshire Violence Against Women Partnership um, Report 23-24. Uh, and Diane Langley, we're very pleased to welcome you to the meeting today to, um, to speak, please. Thank you, Diane. Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll just uh, present the report for noted in consideration um, by the Governance and Scrutiny Committee. Um, the, the annual report covers a wide range of activity across the partnership throughout 2023 to 24. Um, a multi-agency partnership, and I'd like to extend thanks to partners for all their work and their contribution throughout 23 to 24. Um, uh, to present some critical information, first of all, um, we note that the prevalence of violence against women and girls in East Ayrshire, evidenced both by the child protection and the police st statistics, is increasing. Um, both domestic abuse and sexual violence. We know that there are all, these are also underreported and some forms of violence against women and girls are not reported at all, such as commercial sexual exploitation. The increased demand of violence against women and girls is reflected in the increasing demand on our specialist violence against women and girls, I'll say VOG from now on, VOG services, um, who continue to uh, provide a really strong commitment to providing high quality services um, during really difficult times. Feedback from uh, local service users with lived experience of VOG is contained in the appendices of the report and would support the view that they are getting good quality services despite some difficulties in terms of the landscape that the VOG services are operating within. Um, specialist services continue to be under pressure and, and as I say this is reflected in the report and um, the partnership will be working on throughout this year a position statement um, in terms of uh, the situation we find ourselves in and presenting this to the chief officers group probably around September of this year. We would maybe ask you to look out for this in terms of offering any support that you might be able to do so um, in terms of supporting specialist services who provide direct, serv direct support to women and girls who've experienced uh, VOG. Um, moving on, the report highlights the progress of both NHS Ayrshire and Arran and East Ayrshire Council in progressing their work towards achieving equally safe at work. East Ayrshire Council has gained the bronze accreditation in 2023 and is working towards silver. So that's very uh, positive in terms of supporting the workforce um, who may experience VOG issues or to become more competent in uh, supporting either staff or members of the public who experience VOG. Um, Equally Safe in Schools is also a programme that's running in East Ayrshire. Um, there's an ongoing commitment to this. Uh, two schools have piloted the first year and Kilmarnock Academy has gone on to complete its second year. Um, Equally Safe in Schools consists of self-assessment, teacher training, action group, policy development, teaching, monitoring and evaluation. 
So in terms of Kilmarnock Academy, they've already completed their surveys with staff and pupils. Staff have completed e-learning modules. Pupils have viewed part of the e-learning module and an action group has been set up. And the action group will determine an action plan throughout Kilmarnock Academy in the years, in the next year. So this work is still quite early um, and we're still uh, looking to find out what the results of that would be. It's still in progress. Um, the annual report details that there has been a real commitment across the partnership to learning and development. Um, and as we progress a programme, um, we continue to develop the Violence Against Women calendar. There are three new modules available on Learn Pro, um, equally safe in practice. They're developed by Scottish Women's Aid um, on behalf of the Scottish Government. They are called Together for Gender Equality understanding domestic abuse and understanding sexual violence and we'd really um, welcome if elected members were able to take the time to complete these modules it would um, in terms of their ongoing commitment to supporting the um, end in violence against women and girls these modules are available to, available to all east ayrshire staff leisure trust health social care partnership and ara and we have a um, training or a, a, a plan in order to roll these out across all of uh, the staff um, within East Ayrshire. Within um, the report, we also detail the work of 16 days that took place in 2023. There's a full report just on 16 days, um, which is there as an appendix. Um, it was a very successful 16 days. There was lots of activity, but one of our main successes was the campaign on commercial sexual exploitation. We held a practitioner event that 150 people attended. There was an exhibition that raised the voices of women with lived experience. Um, we are currently undertaking a training for trainers programme and we will be delivering training across uh, the partnership um, going forward. As part of this work, we have looked at the position statement on prostitution and have refreshed this to include new um, research and uh, policy direction and it's now called the position statement on commercial sexual exploitation. This has pre been presented to the Violence Against Women Partnership in, um, at the last meeting which was May and it's currently out for consultation with partners. Um, it will go to Chief Officers Group and will be presented to elected members and we'd really welcome if elected members could give us, our, give them, give us their support in terms of that. Planning is already underway for 2024 and we would welcome support with the White Ribbon events, um, our learning festival that we're going to provide and the Reclaim the Night March. Um, moving on, Safe and Together implementation is ongoing. We're supporting staff involved in child protection and child welfare work to, um, to continue to be skilled up in this approach, um, which is quite a different approach in terms of working with families, moving away from victim blaming to a strengths-based approach. And finally, the Violence Against Women Partnership Strategic Plan ended in 2023, December 2023, and we're in the process throughout um, 2024 of developing our new plan in consultation with partners. The first draft will be available in August 2024. There are four main themes, a strategic needs assessment, engaging people with lived experience, culture change in key communities and supporting specialist services. Um, this is undertaken in the context of the National Equally Safe Refresh 2023. Again, we would really welcome any support from elected members in terms of engaging with these areas of work and championing them and supporting us in taking forward this work. I'm now going to pass to my colleague, Dale Meller, who's a senior manager, um, who will provide some input around MARAC. Thanks, Diane. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I also support the Violence Against Women Partnership in my role. Um, within the annual report, um, there's some information about the Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference. Um, and I know that some members would be interested in hearing just a little bit more about that. So I'll provide a bit more detail for you. So the Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference, or MARAC, another acronym, um, is um, we follow in Ayrshire the guidelines from the national um, organisation Safe Lives. We've had the MARAC in place now for two years. It's been operational for two years. Um, Ayrshire was the last area in Scotland to implement this risk assessment framework. The MARAC is, is not a service. A MARAC is a meeting where 
um, agency representatives from all of our key partners who provide protection um, meet um, and to share information about victims at risk of significant harm or death as a result of domestic abuse. Um, and they discuss and share information to make a current risk assessment. And the meeting then goes on for each individual victim or survivor to undertake safety action planning to make sure that that person is safe. Um, in East Asia in 2023-24, as you can see in the report, 162 cases, as we call them, um, were brought to MARAC meetings. Our MARACs run monthly and with a fluctuation in case numbers month to month. In East Asia, we're averaging about 14 uh, cases per month. Um, set in the context of wider Ayrshire, um, so 162 for ourselves in the year, 504 across Ayrshire um, in 2023-24. Um, what happens as a Marac, at a Marac um, is that the victim or survivor themselves isn't there. They are represented by an independent domestic abuse advocacy worker. Um, that's the model for Marac. Um, I think for victims and survivors attending a meeting that's pretty much focused on the risks um, and safety up for them, is, it would be very, very difficult. Um, as a result of the discussion, um, agency representatives come away with additional actions to support that victim or survivor to help them become safe. Sometimes it leads to arrests um, or, um, or it can lead to additional safety actions for the person themselves. Um, I suppose there might be a question of um, how many people should we anticipate might need this kind of approach moving forward. Um, and we do have um, a national estimate that um, is that for, for, we should ex be expecting across Scotland 40 per 10,000 female in the female population might require the level of support that MANAC offers. Um, and we're running just slightly under that at the moment in East Asia, but we're in the second year of operation. Um, and one of the reasons for referrals um, for individuals who come to the MANAC meeting is um, repeat incidents of harm. Um, and we, what we've seen in, in East Asia, indeed across Asia, is the number of repeat referrals are starting to come up in line with what we would expect. Um, I'm sorry, it's obviously not um, a good thing that that is happening, but I suppose in terms of reassuring people that the rate of need is consistent with what we would be expecting across Scotland. Um, so um, I just wanted to provide a bit more detail. We do now have um, the Malak Annual Report, which is a supplementary report, and I'm really happy to share that with members individually or after the meeting if you want to see a bit more detail about the Malak, because I think we'd had some questions following pre-agenda. Thank you. I'll hand you back to Diane. I, I don't have anything else to say other than happy to take any questions or um, answer any queries. Thank you. Um, thank you both of you very much for, for your for your presentation. And I think it's quite shocking and quite shameful that we're still dealing with uh, with the with the with these issues and that it doesn't seem to be diminishing, that it is perhaps increasing. A few things that I'd like to just raise and then I'll open it up to the floor. Um, first of all, under reporting, Diane, I think you 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 said that you felt that there was a significant amount that was underreported. So I'd like you to comment on that, please, and see if there is anything that we could, Dash, should be doing. Um, very interested in the pilot work that you've been doing within our schools, because that is a fundamental starting point, I would suggest, for us to try and address this, this problem. Um, and I would, if, it, if, it, if, if what we're doing is progressive and makes a difference, then of course it would be good to see that being extended to the rest of our schools. Um, and then my third point, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to read my writing here. Um, in terms of the, the modules that, that, that are available online, I wonder if that should be part of a sort of separate briefing note that goes out to elected members, because we get so much information. Um, if we just sort of file this report away, 
it will almost be sort of ticked off and dealt with. And I'm keen that that's not the case here and that that we, we actually put some more stuff out to elected members. So perhaps separately, we'll agree something that we can forward to elected members with a briefing note and the various attachments. So that's um, three points. Sorry, that was a bit vague. Uh, Under-reporting, extending the pilot work and... Um, uh, re referral notes for elected members, please. So, Diane, if you could perhaps respond to that. Thank you. Um, taking your last question first, happy to um, to put out a briefing note and we'll, we'll take that forward from, from today. Um, in terms of under-reporting, I think that has been an issue for decades. One of the, <clears throat> one of the questions is, are statistics rising because people are now reporting more thoroughly because there is more information out in the public realm about different forms of violence against women and it not being appropriate or acceptable in any in any t at any time. So there is a question as, as whether statistics are rising because of more confidence in reporting. However, you will have heard, I'm sure, many times the impact of COVID and the cost of living crisis. And we also think that these are having a, a very direct impact just now in terms of women's experiences. And that might be one other reason for rising statistics. I, I suppose in terms of under-reporting in areas like commercial sexual exploitation or female genital mutilation, I guess how we are trying to tackle that is by having quite broad campaigns like we have in commercial sexual exploitation in the past year, um, involving staff, we'll be taking that into uh, staff across the whole partnership. You know, police have made a really great commitment to um, training all of their 700 staff in Ayrshire on commercial sexual exploitation. That has been um, heralded as an area of good practice that, that has come out of this campaign in Ayrshire. So really what we will be doing is raising awareness of, of these different areas, providing staff with training in order to improve their skills and their confidence about identifying and then supporting women who experience um, different forms of violence against women and then going forward taking these messages into the community and that will be part of our new strategic plan going forward as key messages to take into the community to highlight um, different forms of violence and, and to support people to report it and one Recent success has been the um, messaging on the side of the bin lorries. I'm sure you've heard about that last year. So there'll be different ways of engaging members of the community. We'll be working in partnership with Alcohol and Drugs Partnership, for instance, in terms of accessing some of their key community forums. So that would be how we would try and, I guess, tackle the problem of under-reporting. Um, Set. In terms of piloting within schools, I think it will be helpful to see how this pilot goes and then obviously to have discussions with um, education services about the way forward. That Obviously, there are key um, key members involved in taking this work forward in, in Kilmarnock. So. And um, one of the themes in our new strategic plan, as in an area of focus, will be children and young people in terms of prevention work, which is ties really w yeah. well in with the Equally Safe in School initiatives. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to open this up to, to the floor. Any questions or comments? Stephen. Yeah, thank, thanks for that report. Um, I suppose yeah, the conversation yesterday, I mean, around it's obviously difficult for all the reasons we've talked about reporting for things that have happened recently to, under, to to get a sense of whether things are moving in the right direction. If I pick you up right, I think the chief officer's report might be that's exactly what that's trying to at a high level trying to understand. So I'm certainly be interested to hear to, to to read that in due course. Is is there any merit in a councillor conversation on the back of that report? You know, I think that because. It, as a topic for Councillor Conference, you said I thought this, you know, this was right up there. I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah, I believe we have a Councillor Conversation booked in. Um, I'll not remember the date exactly off the top of my head, but it's booked in during sixteen days of action. So we've we we are keen to engage with you. So we've already got that in the diary. Hey, thanks. And just one other quick question: There's reference to non-mandated interventions. Could you just give us a little bit of background about what that is, as opposed to? Mandated. Sorry. <laughs> Mandated interventions generally tend to be um, prescribed by court 
So there would be interventions such as a um, CPO, which is a community payback order, or attendance at something like the Caledonian programme. There's not a lot of mandated programmes in Scotland. Caledonian programme seems to be the main one. Um, there, there is limited success in a sense because people are told to go. Um, in East Ayrshire and across Scotland, there are little pockets of non-mandated, so voluntary pieces of work that are, are taking place with dads, with partners, in terms of trying to address harmful behaviours. In East Ayrshire, there's some work has taken place in Kilmarnock Prison um, as part of a health and wellbeing, healthy relationship approach. And there has been some work undertaken by Bernardo's as part of their whole family um, approach to um, working with families. So they will, will receive referrals perhaps from social work or health visitor and they'll assess whether this family's um, in a place to undertake that kind of trauma-informed whole family approach. They might not go in and use terms like perpetrator, domestic abuse, it might be more focused around harmful behaviours and how to reduce them, but there's a small area of work developing in that provided by Bernardo's in um, East Asia. Numbers are still quite small. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Any other questions from elected members? Yeah. No, no, I can't see any more. Uh, Diane and Dale, thank you both very much um, for coming along. And again, you are most welcome to stay, but we understand if, um, if you don't. Thank you. And so I move to the recommendations, which are on page 16 under item two. Um, and I, I think we, agree, we, we endorse those. Thank you very much. And so to move on now to item number five on the agenda. And uh, Janie, this one's over to you, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. And good morning, members. This annual report sets out the findings of published care inspectorate inspection reports for 11 early childhood centres and two funded providers during the period the 1st of April 2023 and the 31st of March of this year and also includes the finding of a one inspection report under the former thematic inspection model published in June 22 and was omitted in error from the annual report to this committee on 22nd of June last year. The eight recommendations set out in paragraph two which relate to the inspection reports are all for noting. Paragraphs three to nine provide the background to inspections by the care inspectorate with paragraphs 11 to 14 noting the current position about shared inspections between the Care Inspectorate and Education Scotland. The new shared inspection framework is expected to be published in September this year with a period of testing before it is rolled out. This new framework should reduce the burden on early learning and childcare practitioners and the, the workforce, the wider workforce, and centres as recommended in Professor Muir's report, putting learners at the centre towards a vision for Scottish education, which was published in March 2022. Inspectors use the current quality framework for daycare of children, childminding and school aged childcare to provide independent assurance about the quality of care, play and learning. Paragraphs 15 to 21 set out the key questions and definitions of the evaluations and grades from the quality framework. The four key questions are how good is our care and learning, how good is our setting, how good is our leadership and how good is our staff team. The core quality indicators under the four key questions evaluated in the inspection year noted in this report were 1.1 nurturing care and support, 1.3 play and learning, 2.2 children experience high quality facilities and 3.1 assurance and improvement are well led along with 4.3 staff deployment. The evaluation given to the quality indicator is automatically the evaluation for the key question overall. So where more than one quality indicator per key question is assessed, the overall evaluation for that key question will be the lowest evaluation and grade of the quality indicators for that specific key question. Grades are awarded for each key question on a scale to one to six, where one is unsatisfactory and six is excellent. The care inspectorate can also make recommendations or stipulate requirements as part of the inspection as set out in paragraphs 22 to 33. 
A recommendation or area for improvement is a statement that sets out actions that a provider should take to improve or develop the quality of the service, but where failure to do so would not directly result in enforcement action. A requirement is a statement which sets out what a service must do to improve outcomes for people who use services and must be linked to a breach in the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, its regulations as per the Social Care and Social Work Improvement Scotland Regulations 2011, or orders made under the Act or a condition of registration. All requirements are enforceable in law. Paragraphs 33, 34 to 36 highlight the national standard for funded early learning and childcare, which all local authority, private and voluntary sector providers, including childminders, must meet if they are to provide funded early learning and childcare places. All settings providing these places need to meet specific criteria as part of the national standard and achieve evaluations of good or better in care inspector inspections. When settings, including childminders, drop below the required quality criteria as set out in the national standard, they will be given a fair service improvement period in which to address this before their funded provider status is removed. For example, where a setting, including childminders, fall below the quality evaluation of good, they will be inspected again within six, within six to 12 months. The focus of the inspection will be on aspects of the service that require to improve. Paragraphs 37 to 42 describes the local authority role as the primary guarantor of quality. Local authorities must assess and monitor compliance of all funded providers and childminders against the national standard, which they all need to meet if they are to deliver funded places. The local authority in its role as primary guarantor of quality needs to be clear about its expectations, including the criteria within the national standard that are not being met and how the service can improve this to ensure children receive high quality early learning and childcare. Settings in this position may need enhanced support before they are inspected. The evaluations of the quality indicators and the summary of the key messages for each of the 14 settings inspected are set out in pages 9 to 32 of this report, and Appendix 1 sets out the collated evaluations for each setting. 13 of the 14 settings inspected achieved grades of good or better at inspection, and one fund provider met the quality criteria in one of the key questions, but fell below the threshold of good in three of the key questions. Bells Bank was inspected on the 27th of May 2022 under the former thematic model of inspection and the report was published on the 29th of June 2022. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no recommendations for improvement. The grades and valuations of the quality themes of care and support and their environment were very good and the grades and evaluations for the quality of staffing and management were also very good. The key messages from the thematic inspection are noted on pages 10 and 11. On page 11, paragraph 9, there is an error about the number of inspection reports published under the new quality uh, framework. It reads that there were 12 inspection reports published for 11 early childhood centres and one funded provider. This should read that there were 13 inspection report reports published for 11 childhood centres and two funded providers. I'll go through some of the inspections and highlight some of the key messages and other points of note. Nether Robertland was inspected in March 2023 and the report was published in May 2023. And at this inspection, the service received valuations of good across all four key questions. Key messages noted are that the children's care was supported by the use of personal planning. They had opportunities for play and learning, which was enhanced through connections to their own and wider community. The children showed moderate level of engagement and made some progress in the activities, but were easily distracted. Consultation with parents was variable, resulting in missed opportunities to consider their views. And staff engaged with leadership tasks through champion roles within the service, and this positively impacted on children's experiences. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations. And there were two areas for improvement under quality indicator 2.2, children experience high quality of facilities and quality indicator 4.3, staff deployment. And I'm pleased to say that progress has been made in both areas. 
Lonehead Early Childhood Centre was inspected in May 2023 and the report published in June 2023. At this inspection, the service received evaluations of very good in two key questions and good in two key questions. Key messages are that management and staff place children at the heart of their work, ensuring they felt loved, happy and well supported. Children were having fun and making lots of choices about their own play and learning. An enthusiastic and motivated management and staff team worked well together to develop the service. Children were cared for in a bright, spacious environment. Self-evaluation and improvement planning should now be further developed to support the continuous development of the service and the range of toys and resources should be reviewed and further developed. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement at this inspection. Domellington Early Childhood Centre was inspected in June 2023 and the report published in July 23. At this inspection, the service received evaluations of very good across all four key questions. Key messages were that children experience warmth, caring and nurturing approaches to support their overall well-being, that staff have a very good understanding of child development, relevant theory and practice, and skillfully used it to support children. Children had access to a very good range of resources that were clean and well organised and encouraged exploration, inquiry and fun. Parents were actively involved in the life of the service and consulted regularly in a meaningful way. Children and staff enjoyed a close, happy and respectful relationship with each other and there was a strong sense of togetherness across the whole staff team. This service had no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement made. Dunlop Early Childhood Centre was inspected in May 2023 and the report was published in August 23. At this inspection, the service received evaluations of very good in two key questions and good in two key questions. Key messages were that positive attachments contributed to children feeling well supported, valued and loved. Children were happy and busy while actively leading their own learning. And a culture of continuous professional development supported staff to develop confidence when providing positive outcomes for children. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement at this inspection. Drongan Early Childhood Centre was inspected in August 23 and the report published in September 23. At this inspection, the service received evaluations of good across all four key questions. Key messages were that supportive interactions where staff showed kindness and understanding helped children to feel safe and secure. Children were spoken to and listened in ways that encouraged them to feel valued and included. The premises were safe and well maintained to ensure children's safety. Quality assurance processes had recently been reviewed and improved to support positive outcomes for children and families. The management staff remains receptive to inspectors' feedback and showed a commitment to the ongoing development of the service. Management staff should ensure that children consistently receive play experiences which support their natural curiosity, creativity and inquiry. Increasing opportunities for family participation in the life of the setting should be prioritised and widening opportunities for outdoor play beyond the setting should be considered in future improvement and professional development planning. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and there was one area for improvement under quality indicator 1.3, play and learning, and progress has been made in this area. Flower Bank Early Childhood Centre was inspected in July 23 and the report was published in October 23. At this inspection, the service received evaluations of very good in one key question and good in three key questions. Key messages are that children's emotional development and overall well-being staff always engage with children at their level and use supported language. Children were keen to engage with staff in their play throughout the day. Inspectors asked that some improvements were made to the environment by further developing the cosy areas available to children. Children had very good access to local community through a wide range of opportunities and they supported children to become more confident communicators. And the service was appropriately staffed to meet the needs of children and to keep them safe and attending the service. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement made at this inspection. New Cumnock Early Childhood Centre was inspected in September 23 and the report published in October 23. At this inspection, the, the service received evaluations very good across all four key questions. 
Key messages noted were that staff were welcoming and friendly with an enabling attitude and they knew the children very well. Children were happy and confident during play and were progressing well in their learning environment. The indoor and outdoor environments were sensitively structured and took account of children's stages of development and learning. Staff and parents enjoyed positive relationships as they had access to playrooms and shared daily updates on children's progress and development. And staff knew children, families and their circumstances well. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement at this inspection. Darville Early Childhood Centre was inspected in October 23 and the report published in November 23. At this inspection, the service received evaluations of very good across all key okay. questions. Key messages noted that children benefited from nurturing interactions with staff, which helped them to feel valued and loved. Children experienced high quality care, play and learning. They had fun, joy and laughter throughout the day. Children experienced interesting and motivating play and learning opportunities, particularly within the secure outdoor play space. Staff were deployed in such a way that supported continuity in children's care and their effective supervision. And a continuous culture of improvement was embraced and enabled children to have consistently positive experiences. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement at this inspection. Jerry Tree's Early Childhood Centre was inspected in January 24 as a follow up to the previous inspection in October 22. The outcome of the previous inspection was reported in the annual report to this committee on the 22nd of June 2023. And at this inspection, the service received evaluations of good for one key question and adequate for three key questions. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations. However, there were six areas for improvement under quality indicator 1.3 play and learning, 2.2 children experience high quality facilities and 3.1 quality assurance and improvements are well led. As three of the key questions evaluated as adequate, the service was subject to a 12 month service improvement period as it did not meet the national standard for early learning and childcare. The service received enhanced improvement support from early years officers and the local authorities' role as primary guarantor of quality to secure improvement and to ensure children receive high quality early learning and childcare. The service made good progress during this period and addressed all actions in its action plan. In our role as guarantor of quality, we were confident that the evaluation of the quality indicators would be good or better at the next inspection. A further unannounced inspection took place on the 29th of January 2024 and Tuesday the 30th of January 2024 and the inspection was carried out by three inspectors from the Care Inspectorate. The key messages were that children benefited from positive attachments with staff, children had opportunities to have fun and lead their play and learning, the service should continue with plans to improve the outdoor space, the management staff team were committed to delivering a quality service for children and families and children benefited from a staff team with a good mix of skills, knowledge and experience. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement made at this inspection. Catchin Early Childhood Centre was inspected in February 2020. 24 and the report published in March 24. At this inspection, the service received evaluations of very good across all four key questions. Key messages were that staff were warm, caring and nurturing. They knew children very well and responded to their needs sensitively in line with the information recorded in their personal plans. Strong relationships had been established with families, which resulted in positive outcomes for children. Children were happy, having fun and participated in high quality play which supported them to progress in their learning and development. Access to the well-resourced garden area provided children with rich play opportunities which supported their overall well-being. The newly renovated environment was safe, clean, homely and well-maintained to ensure children's safety. Staff were skilled, knowledgeable and committed to the continuous development of the service and distributive leadership was celebrated and used to self-evaluate the service and plan improvements. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations and no areas for improvement at this inspection. Logan Early Childhood, uh, Early Childhood Centre was inspected in December 23 as a follow up to the previous inspection in May 22. The outcome of this thematic inspection in May was reported in the annual report to this committee 
on the 22nd of June 2023. At this inspection, two of the four themes were assessed. Quality of care and support was assessed as adequate and quality of environment was assessed as good. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations. However, there were four recommendations made to improve the service under the theme of quality of care and support. As this quality theme received an evaluation of adequate, the service was subject to a 12 month service improvement period as it did not meet the national standard for early learning and childcare. And the service received enhanced improvement support from early years officers in its role as primary guarantor of quality. The service made good progress in most areas during this period and addressed all actions in its action plan. A further unannounced inspection took place on Wednesday the 7th of December, 7th of December 2023 and Thursday the 8th of December 23. The inspection was carried out by two inspectors from the Care Inspectorate and the report was published in 20, January 2024 and noted the improvements in the evaluations of good across all four key questions. Key messages were that children experienced nurturing warm interactions from staff who knew their preferences and routines. They were settled and engaged in play across the service. They had free flow access to the outdoors throughout the day. The staff team was supported by a committed head teacher and senior leadership team, and they worked well together to create a welcoming environment for children. There were no requirements under the statutory uh, regulations. While three of the four recommendations made at this inspection in May had been met, one recommendation had not been met and therefore was noted as an area for improvement under quality indicator 1.3 play and learning. Inspectors did observe that planning processes were in place, however, they were at an early stage and there was missed opportunities to challenge and extend children's learning. However, since the publication of the inspection report, the service has made good progress in developing and embedding its planning processes. During the inspection year of 1st of April 2023 to 31st of March 2024, two of the funded providers delivering funded early and child care had an inspection. Burns Bairns was inspected in April 2023 and then at this inspection the service received evaluations of good across one key question and adequate for three key questions. Key messages were that children experience warm, nurturing, nurturing approaches to support their overall well-being, that, that they had built positive relationships with staff. Staff communicated well with parents through notice boards and on social media. The staff were committed to continuous professional development, that the service should review their mealtime routines, medication procedures and learning environments to ensure these are providing the best possible outcomes for children that the service should ensure self-evaluation processes are consistent to support them in evaluating the service. The service should ensure monitoring procedures are in place, highlighting any areas for improvement. There were no requirements under the statutory regulations. However, there were four areas for improvement made at this inspection under three of the quality indicators. Quality indicator 1.1, nurturing care and support, 1.3, play and learning, and 3.1, quality assurance and improvements are well led. As three of the four questions evaluated as adequate, the service is currently subject to a 12 month service improvement period as it did not meet the national standard for early learning and childcare. The service is currently receiving enhanced support from early years offices in the local authority in its role as uh, primary guarantor of quality to ensure improvement and ensure children receive high quality early learning and childcare. The care inspectorate will return to Burns Bairns within 12 months to undertake another inspection. And I can report that they've just recently visited Burns Bairns, but the report will be published and reported to this committee next year. Beechwood House Nursery was inspected in July 2023 as a follow up to the previous inspection in September 2022. The outcome of this inspection in September 22 was reported to this committee in June of last year. And at this inspection, the service received evaluations of good for one key question and adequate for three key questions. There were two requirements under the statutory regulations that by October 2022, the provider must ensure children's health needs are managed effectively to promote their safety and well-being. And the second requirement was by December 2022, the provider must ensure that all leaders of child protection have the competencies required to fulfil their roles and responsibilities. 
The five areas for improvement under quality indicators were 1.1, nurturing care and support, 1.3, play and learning, 3.1, quality assurance and improvements are well led, and 4.3, staff deployment. As there were two requirements and three of the four key questions evalu evaluated as adequate at the inspection, the service was subject to a 12-month service improvement period as it did not meet the national standard for early learning and childcare and the service has received en enhanced improvement support from ourselves in the local authorities' role as primary guarantor of quality to, to secure compliance with the regulations and improvements to ensure children receive high quality early learning and childcare. The further unannounced inspection was on the 5th of July 2023 and carried out by two inspectors. The inspectors reviewed the previous inspection findings, which include the two requirements to comply with the regulations and five areas for improvement. Inspectors noted that actions had been met in the timescale stipulated in the previous inspection report, so both requirements had been met. Arrangements for the management of medication were reviewed and improved in line with best practice guidance and management and staff participated in training that was appropriate to their roles and responsibility in relation to child inspection. Child protection, sorry. At this inspection, the four key questions were evaluated as good. There were no requirements made under the statutory regulations. However, while four of the five areas for improvement had been met, one area for, for improvement was identified as needing further development under quality indicator 3.1, quality assurance and improvement are well led. The service was asked to further develop its self-evaluation processes, which should help identify and prioritise improvements needed and inform the development of an improvement plan. The service continues to make progress in self-evaluation and has identified priorities. The provider, management and staff have worked hard together to develop good practice and improve outcomes for children. In conclusion, Chair, the re inspection reports for all early childhood centres and funded providers are set out in full in the Care Inspectorate website. And as noted in the report, all requirements have been addressed and all recommendations, areas for improvement have been progressed. That concludes the report, Chair, and happy to take any questions. Janie, thank you very much. That's a, a mammoth report. Thank you very much for, 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 for all of that. And it's hugely reassuring um, that this degree of scrutiny takes place. And um, I think uplifting to, to, to then see the improvements that, 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 that we can see in evidence at Cherry Trees and Logan, and then look forward to the same from Burns Burns. Um, of course, within primary education, we have our um, we, we've got our established improvement program. Which do we have something similar within the the ECCs that that, that we take out so that so that the 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 teachers the head teachers can can prepare themselves for what's coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair, for that question. Yes, there is something similar in um, our early childhood centres and also for our seven funded providers and our 40 registered childminders that are on the um, Council's framework to deliver funded early learning and childcare. We have two improvement officers who um, undertake audits against the national standard across all services. And these audits are in the main, very, very positive. Sometimes they highlight areas for improvement and some to, sometimes those improvements are still taking place when the care inspectorate calls because care inspectorate inspections are unannounced, unlike Education Scotland inspections where they are announced. Um, we also have a small team of peripatetic teachers who are deployed in our funded providers and some of our early childhood centres if they're needing some additional support. And we have our community childcare service that provides support to all of the childminders in East Ayrshire, but specifically to the 40 that are on the council's framework to deliver early learning childcare. So we do have, have something similar, which is against the national standard because we have a role and a responsibility and our role as primary guarantor to provide that support, but also to provide that challenge. And in addition to the, the work that the, the team um, undertake in primary and secondary schools in terms of learning visits, learning visits do also happen in our early childhood centres as well. hope that answers the question, Councillor Cochrane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to open this up to the floor. Councillor Richardson. 
Thanks, Gia. Thanks, Sally. It's just a question for Janie, and it's not really this might be a wee bit unfair because I know the um, you know the way uh, government scrutiny works. We're looking at reports that happened you know a wee while ago, and I know that we look at things after the event. It was a really good report, and it was good to see that most of the, um, the inspections went well. This is really a question about something I noticed over the last two to three months. So it's more a kind of up to date question. There were a lot of um, member. Um, briefing notes coming out across the whole um, authority, really, but also, you know, ones that were specifically um, ECCs in my own ward, whereby we had to reduce uh, service levels for a number of days in certain ECCs because uh, of staffing levels. And I have noticed that there seemed to be a rush of these maybe about a month or two ago, but now... I'm hoping the situation across the uh, the authority is better because these member briefing notes seem to have dried up, which is good news because we're not obviously having to reduce service levels in ECCs currently because there are no briefings coming out. I just wondered if, um, if Janie could give us some information as to why there seemed to be a rush of uh, briefing notes maybe a month or two ago. Uh, about service levels across the network having to be reduced, and what what have we done? What have education done to improve matters? Because it obviously has improved. Because, as I say, there seem to, these seem to be coming out on a regular basis. But for the last, I would say, month, I haven't received any. So obviously, some steps must have been taken. Um, Chair, through you, that that is a huge question you've asked me, and I'm going to do my best to answer it. But it links into East Ayrshire performs as well. Um, what what I would say is that, um, as you will know from East Ayrshire performs, that we've had a very large overspend in terms of the early learning and childcare budget for 11 40 years because we've only been given a, a definitive amount of money um, to deliver 11 40 hours. Um, and unfortunately, we had to put a pause on recruitment. So there's been a lot of wrestling going on in terms of um, posts that we had to fill, which were critical to deliver the service, but also posts that potentially we could wait and not fill till later on. Um, but also in terms of our 52-year services where staff have annual leave, um, long-term sick absence and regular sick absence across, across the piece. It has effectively been a perfect storm in terms of maintaining service delivery and having to make very difficult decisions in individual establishments to still deliver a service, but do that on a reduced basis so that all children have access to early learning and childcare, but neighbor, maybe not their full 1140 hours. The reason why things have improved um, over, um, I would say, January to, to June is that um, we were able to advertise for staff for the bank list. Um, and the advert went out in January and we were able to recruit in February with most people coming on stream onto the bank list in, in March of this year. Um, so they have to go through the, the usual formal rec the recruitment checks, as you'll appreciate. Um, as children come in, the last cohort of children come in in March, so that is when we are our, our highest number of children who have access to early learning, early learning and childcare. So it's important then that we have the staff in the right places to support the children that are attending. So there's been a lot of movement in terms of our services, moving staff from one establishment to another establishment to maintain. We've still had to reduce services. So all of this has not come, you know, uh, it's, it's come at a cost, a cost that um, really um, was, was dis disappointing, shouldn't shouldn't have happened that way. But however, um, it, it did happen. Um, but we're back on target now in terms of having a reasonably healthy supply list, people returning to work after long-term sick leave, people still having annual leave, obviously, until um, the, end, the end of June. Um, and... We may have some wee blips here and there, but in the main, we're able to maintain all our services now. We do have the best value review going on at the moment 
um, and that will be going to Cabinet in August um, after the recess. And that will look at some of the management actions we've had to take for 23-24 and also recommendations for the future of early learning and childcare in East, in East Ayrshire, which will be sustainable. And that is one of our key priorities at the moment. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks very much to Janie for that for that answer. That was uh, very thorough. Yes, thank you, and thank you for bringing that issue up because you're absolutely right. There was a, a, a plethora of the um, of briefing notes, so thank you, thank you. Any other questions? No, no, I don't think so. So we move to the the recommendations on page seventy, item number two. So I think we've we've approved all of those. So um, so. You're, you're, you're free to depart if you would like to. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move on to item number six, which is the Governance and Scrutiny Committee Annual Self-Assessment. Uh, David, over to you. Thanks, Chair. It's that time of year again. As members know, <clears throat> we have for the last few years adopted the practice of carrying out the annual self-assessment. The background section of the report tells you it was the external auditors to blame for it because uh, they'd helpfully suggested we do it. But uh, without making light uh, as best practice, we do all follow uh, all councils apply the same approach and follow the SIPFA guidance, which will be further updated, I think, later this year. Uh, so members met, or as set out in this paper, members met on the 13th of May 24 to carry out uh, this year's self-assessment. As in previous years, that's carried out on an informal workshop basis to allow a greater and more open level of discussion and analysis than might be possible in a more formal public setting. But we always report on the outcome uh, as set out here. Uh, what you have members is reference there to the arrangements in Paris 6 to 9 and reference to and links to the guide that sits behind us from, from SIPFA. In terms of outcomes from this year, you have the note of the meeting uh, on the 13th, uh, Appendix 1, uh, for your consent page 111. So that's just for, for noting and approval. Members are happy. That's a proper reflection of our discussions. In general terms, the output from the meeting was that, that members were happy we carry on a positive direction of travel and that uh, some of the admittedly minor matters that had been identified before had been taken forward. Uh, there was a, a greater degree of confidence, I think, which has just come naturally as uh, we identified in 2022 following the election. All of the committee members, apart from yourself, Chair, were new to the committee for a member right. Um, and therefore, it's been quite a learning curve for everybody. But I think over the, the past two years, the assessment reflected that members themselves feel more confident, confident and comfortable in the role. And with the, the support and training that's put in place to support them in applying the scrutiny function. We have actually uh, appendix to uh, m both the previous summary uh, action plan uh, updated in terms of where we're at, and then at page 117, apologies, there's two in the one appendix, but at page 117, you actually have the action plan from 2024. There's not a lot left. Um, most of these are ones where the committee's not been particularly persuaded that action is uh, required or merited, but I've agreed to keep matters under review and see what happens elsewhere, see what happens in the national picture, see if there's any refinement from SIPFA. And uh, there's one or two where we'll keep our options open, but there's not been any particular identified need to act. So uh, members have agreed they're quite happy to, to leave some in abeyance uh, and keep them under that annual review. Starting at page 117, in terms of the, the agreed actions, the areas where there may be something to do, if not now in the future, then the first of those related to um, the uh, committee being established and this is issue of uh, inviting on lay or co-opted members. The position remains as per previous year's discussion. Not many councils have actually 
been persuaded there's merit in that. Some have gone out, some have struggled to find a suitable candidate and haven't brought anyone onto their committee. Some have struggled uh, or have brought them on and then are now, I won't say wishing they haven't, we're in public session, but uh, are now reviewing whether or not it's actually adding any value or um, adding anything uh, additional to, to the operation of their committees. And there's no absolute pressing need uh, to, to, to bring anyone on seem to be the collective view of the members so that one's there and it's just one we'll pick up each year and if at any time the mood of the committee or the, the context changes and we take a different decision then fine but I think the general mood of the committee is there's no requirement to go down the road of bringing on anyone else when you consider the mix and range of skills uh, within the membership of the committee as well as the support that's available from uh, both internal and external audit and other, or other officers. The next one on page 117 was around uh, the general development of knowledge, skills and training of committee members. And, and that's always an ongoing task. So uh, the improvement agreed was was uh, still to further develop knowledge and skills. I think improvement's the wrong word. It's an ongoing activity. It's not something you ever stop doing. None of us ever stop learning. Uh, so that will be uh, considered again, but that will be the training and development needs throughout 2024. Members are now familiar with what's in offer in terms of the initial induction and ongoing support. And I think it's just incumbent for this committee at any time, should any member uh, identify anything there. It doesn't need to wait to the annual self-assessment. It's something that can be raised in discussion at the committee with other members. And the committee can agree at any time to put anything reasonable and appropriate in place to support the activity of the committee. In terms of the other actions, just check I'm going the right way here. But I wasn't. Uh, moving on to page 118, uh, we also, the committee uh, noted uh, in terms of, this relates to the canal and the, the proactive against the reactive. Uh, the first of this one is the committee, no governance and scrutiny committee should just focus and, and just accept what's put in front of it and simply keep its focus restricted to what's put in front of it. Reports for officers. This is the other arm, which is the committee itself uh, putting arrangements in place to identify uh, areas of council activity and operation where the committee feels uh, additional scrutiny may well be of benefit. That doesn't just need to be where there uh, are perceived to be problems or poor performance. That's one way of identifying it, but it's also appropriate just to look at where we might be looking at significant change of our operational arrangements uh, or other significant issues that are coming over the hill. So it's a wee bit more about getting on the front foot and the committee determining for itself where the committee would like to expend its efforts and not purely existing on a diet of reports from us officers. So I think uh, what you may want to do as a committee uh, starting in the next session, and we'll be happy to support it, is perhaps have, even I end on to one of the, the, the meetings, but maybe one of the lighter agendas, is just have that discussion amongst yourselves and identify by agreement where at least the majority of you thinks the committee, if there is that appetite, would be best served by applying the old searchlight scrutiny to other areas that aren't necessarily covered by the very wide and detailed range of reports that you do see on an annual basis. So that's one to, I think, take forward in 24-25 and arrange that discussion. It doesn't need to be a workshop per se. It's simply an open discussion amongst you, the members, as to where you think you may want to go and have a positive or proactive look uh, rather than, than, as I say, simply the, the report-based approach. In terms of on page 119, uh, the other one's coming out where this um, small matter of, of uh, are you meeting annually in private with the external auditors? And quite simply, I think the committee members are happy that, that the need has never arisen. Uh, I think we're a bit different in terms of the level of engagement and involvement with the auditors in a positive way. Uh, as you've heard Joe tell you before, they actually like coming here. Um, and they actually go away quite impressed with the way the committee operates. So if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. And if the auditors need a meeting with us, they know the door's open. If they need a meeting with you in private, uh, with the membership, then that option's always there. But if the need hasn't arisen, there's no point in having a meeting for meeting's sake. Uh, certainly not in the, the current climate. So again, 
it's for you as members uh, to keep that one under review and uh, when the external auditors are here you're always welcome to ask them if they should ever need, feel the need for uh, that meeting in private with yourselves and then you have uh, the one around the feedback and the committee did have a look at some of the feedback we've received and this was simply the follow-up to the previous decision to put arrangements in place to invite those who members of the public who might view the video and uh, record delayed broadcast of gns meetings to give their commentary and very low numbers have i think it's only two or three at the moment some of our frequent flyers i think they got lost i think they were looking for the planning committee but never mind um the uh, and and also officers and other members uh, obviously the the other members as a reduced audience because you yourselves wouldn't wouldn't be given that feedback but it would be the rest of the members and there was some feedback from senior officers as well so those arrangements are in place and I think all you can really do is as as we've said continue with them and continue to encourage other members officers and to an extent as best we can members of the public uh, to continue to offer their feedback in order to shape and inform the future operation of the committee uh, and the uh, and that's that's the actions arising and the only other thing i would say at this stage chair is uh, in terms of the four members of recall at page 120 there's a rather bloated uh, self-assessment of good practice form that was produced by sipfa in previous years we'd invited members to individually return that with their own views and then at the discussion at the annual self-assessment exercise we've sought to distill that into a single one i think given that the form isn't exactly user friendly you could debate till the cows come home what some of the questions actually mean as we've done in the past uh, with more than one legitimate answer been put forward i think uh, we stood down members doing the individual bit prior to the self-assessment, but we did at the self-assessment on the 13th of May actually go through that exercise of a updating or revisiting it from last year and as stated in paragraph 10 that the general view of the members was that the, the few areas that were down for maybe minor improvement have improved we did actually go through the exercise of line by line box by box but we haven't quite captured that and i think there was a misunderstanding that by not having members do the individual bit we were abandoning the annual bit but i think it makes sense year on year to have a version of this so we'll go with what we've got this year in terms of para 10 and the one in front of you but I think next year when we come out of that self-assessment part of the objective should be to have a 2025 version because it's important to have a, an annual record of where the committee thinks it is we have it here just not quite the same form but I think members are clear on on the fact that, that there are only a handful of issues and they're certainly not of any great significance so I think as I said I would step back again from individual completion prior to the assessment but invite the committee to go through that again next Next year and in future years but i think we have enough of a linkage from last year to next year that it doesn't require revisiting it and the back of that chair happy to stop now and um, refer members to the recommendations happy to take any other questions but the main thing is that members are happy this properly reflects your thoughts and your decisions and your discussion on the 13th of may Thank you, David. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I actually wasn't here on the 13th of May, but I've been through the paper. And um, just to pick up on a couple of the themes, I don't see any need to include uh, an external person in on the committee, because I think, as, as you pointed out, that we're, between us, we've got quite a broad um, range of skills and experience. And I think that we bring what, what is required. Um, as far as the proactive position is concerned, I think that's an excellent idea. It is something that perhaps we should be doing more of. Um, and so, we'll, as, as you've suggested, perhaps include that on one of the lighter agendas. And, and then on to the form, the final bit. Yes, let's do that, but do it afresh when we come to do the assessment next time round in a year's time from now. So, but, uh, having made those comments, uh, I'll open it up to the floor. Thank you. David, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Sally. No, I'd, I'd agree with those comments, Sally. I think there's, um, um, especially point two. I think point two would be quite interesting if we were to have a, an agenda point in a in a lighter um, governance and scrutiny month, where um, you know the members could have a, a discussion and think about other areas that we would like to to look at 
rather than as David said, just rely on the uh, the reports were fed. I think that would be that would be quite interesting. I know I've got a couple of ideas of areas of the council where we might want to, um, you know, have a wee uh, slightly deeper look. But you know, I think the the comments you made, Sally, are absolutely absolutely fine. Anything else? Any anybody else? Anybody online? No, no. Okay, so so we'll um, endorse the recommendations and uh, move on, David, to item number six, which is back to you. And I would sorry, item number seven. Thanks, Chair. Thank this is simply the latest in the series of reports that advises the committee and puts on the record uh, the decisions taken under the, the delegated authority on the awarding of a whole range of contracts in the period from the 23rd of May to the 6th of June. The format of the report is standard members. I won't take your time up with that. And from page 129 onwards, you have in the appendix all the details of all the relevant contracts awarded within that period. You have a note where it was done under the Cabinet Authority in some occasions, and you have a note where it was done under the normal delegated arrangements with sign off by the Head of Service. As members know, the arrangements are all contracts that are awarded under delegation are usually signed off by myself, uh, having been through some form of appropriate and formal procurement process. Uh, so if, if, if tendering processes are undertaken in accordance with the standing orders and relating to contracts, then they don't need to come to committee because effectively if you followed the process there can only be one outcome which is the best bid or the preferred bidder and regulated ones um, is, is, is expecting has a reasonable and legitimate expectation to be awarded the contract but what we do is come to cabinet for approval if anybody wants to adopt or needs to adopt in particular circumstances a different approach so because there is no regular reporting or decision making in public around the award of the contracts eh, the concomitant is we bring it here and put it on the public domain eh, in the basis of transparency and accountability all the business we do and it's there and we also as we have over time improved and added to the format we record the community benefits that we get not in all contracts but where they are appropriate and uh, what shape they will take uh, and we record all the other relevant information so in essence everyone can see not just who we're doing business with but who else had the chance to bid for that business and satisfy themselves the basis in which we award these contracts which is as members are well aware not purely based on price but based on the most economically advantageous tender in any given situation uh, so if there's any questions or queries, I'm happy to take them. But as I always say, the actual number of contracts, the range of supplies or services and goods and works that are undertaken, just give a, a, a timely reminder of the absolute width and depth of all the different activities that the Council carries out. David, thank you very much for that. Is there any weighting attached to local um, suppliers? It's not so much about attaching waiting, <clears throat> it's about finding creative ways uh, to work within the rules. So you have your UK legislation, which has just been changed, uh, Scottish uh, procurement rules and regulations follow the UK model. Scotland will be redoing it after the, the now that the UK ones post Brexit are in place, but they're not actually making wholesale changes because it's a good model. The, the previous kind of EU led model is still a good model for public procurement. So there won't be a uh, wholesale uh, uh, change. So the rules don't necessarily just require you to, to, you know, the rules are absolutely about level playing field and treating all bidders consistently. And therefore, you know, there are, there are difficulties in just trying to give extra weight to locals. But the way you do it is how you construct uh, how you construct the contract and what approach you take. An example at the moment, I was just talking to the, the head of care yesterday, uh, Dr Eric Sutherland at the CMT. There's one there, and uh, some of the members are aware, uh, we're up for the aids and adaptations. So we initially looked at that and we went out to see if it could be included in the HAS framework for, for what was required. But sometimes you recognise that if you go down that route and you're looking for a single supplier for the whole of the 
area, then a single supplier and a contract is probably going to, you know, in a lot of instances, will protect themselves because if they might be going to Dumellington or Dunlop, then if it's the same charge throughout the area, the charge is going to reflect the fact they might have that further travelling time. So breaking it down into lots. Uh, so we went out to tender in one. It's not yielding either the providers or the prices we might have hoped for. So it doesn't mean you just need to accept that. We're now going to look at a bespoke tender. So it's all in the packaging. It's all about how you package it up and getting a balance between not packaging it up in a way that you know is going to cost us more money, but packaging it up in a way that's legitimate within the rules that actually does allow legitimate uh, direct enough business at an appropriate level to local businesses or at least create an environment where they can uh, participate on a competitive basis and put in a bid with a chance of winning rather than just going, going through a process. So it's not about giving them extra points on a bid, it's about finding ways to construct your tender and your specification and your whole approach that actually maximises the ability of local companies to come in with a degree of confidence they might actually win something. But the more you break things down, that can that can bring its own issues as well. So it's about balance, and it's not about putting things into individual streets, but not even perhaps wards, and something maybe more than just north and south. But you break it down into sensible lots, you look at where the business is, and then if you break it down into geographical lots, you might have more contractors to manage, but there's a chance somebody might come in that's happy to do the Melanton at a price that he can afford to sustain because he's never going up to Dunlop. So it's about how we package it rather than how we evaluate the bids. Thank you very much. And are there any more questions? Stephen? Yeah. No, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just a comment. I mean, obviously, there's the two sides there, isn't there? I mean, we, we try and, if possible, get local businesses because it keeps money in the, the area. But there's also the other side about trying to get businesses to come in and, and bid for public works. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Supplier Development Programme, um, which I can sort of give you some information on later. I'm the Council's representative on the, the board, and that's basically around training and um, also highlighting opportunities for local businesses to get into um, public sector work. Because I think it can be a bit off-putting for some businesses and it's actually not that. We do our own stuff through uh, Business Gateway, but um, you know that is a programme that I think we need to, to, to spread and, and we need to try and get businesses to, to bid for it and to try and get into that work as well as us trying to you know give it to them where possible. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I would be interested in it. Thank you. Thank you. David, did you, did yeah, you I was just going to say that on that score, the most recent one was just up at Hamden at the beginning of the month and according to my procurement colleagues, it was going like a fair. So that is the other aspect. There's how we package it up. And then as Councillor Cannon rightly says, there's a bit over there where we actually make sure local businesses are cited on where to go. And basically it's get yourself on the portal, the, the procurement portal that the Scottish Government operate and just note your interest in particular types of contracts and then they will come. The opportunities to bid come through your email uh, and in the form of alerts, so it's getting companies in that position. But there's no point in having them positioned, as I say, if we're putting something out where it's one big package, winner takes all, uh, you know, for all your property maintenance, and it goes to a multinational based in London with Sally offices all through the country. Uh, but as members know, because we bring the annual procurement report here, we bring the, the annual plan to Cabinet, and then we bring, and it'll come in September. So around about September, October, you'll see last year's output, and it's not that long since since we looked at the year before, and you'll recall, uh, and I've not got the figures right in front of me, but it was a good sizable chunk, and it is a, a, is a, a, an improving or a, an increasingly positive picture as the result of all these efforts to find compliant but clever ways to maximise the involvement of local businesses in our economy uh, continues to take hold. So you, you see that in terms of where East Ayrshire is and in terms of Ayrshire businesses, uh, and that will be coming again in September, and that has been an an upward direction uh, as we, we all try and maximise and bring together their interest and our ability to award and that comes back to how you package it and getting the balance right, not going too big that it excludes the wee ones and not going so wee that you're paying more than you ought to be but there is a balance and it's just about in each context depending on what the goods or services are, finding the best and most compliant way that strikes the balance uh, that helps us achieve what, what twin aims of best value while supporting the local economy which is not to say it always costs more uh, on an individual job, it's just a about the, 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 the balance of managing one big contractor, which has its an advantage, or managing lots of, of smaller 
smaller ones, which can, for them, have as advantages, but it can have an inherent cost as well. So it's just about balancing all that out. But the main thing is about the packaging. And as Councillor Cannon says, supporting folk. And we have local events, but there's also, the last one was the Meet the Buyer at Hamden there. And I think you all got something from uh, I think somebody at South Lancashire actually just to pass on up is to go into local businesses to help people in and direct them to those kind of events if they're not already on the portal. But if you've got a local business and you're on the portal and you've got all the alerts in in terms of any of the kind of contracts you'd be wanting to bid for, then you're sorted. Those those alerts will come and those opportunities will, will literally come to your, your laptop, your computer. Yeah, thank you very much for that, and thank you for, 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 for telling us about that. And of course, where there is a skills deficit, which may well be the case with some of the smaller businesses, we, it, would be, it would be good if we were in a position to assist. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Online, no, no, none online. That's... Um, Item number seven um, with, the, with the recommendations. Thank you very much. So we will now move on to the final item on the agenda. Um, number eight, East Ayrshire performs. And um, Colin, I think this is over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is the end of year East Ayrshire performs report. And it shows that if we exclude the financial outturn for our services and spend a moment on the corporate budget, council tax, etc., then we see that the council has ended the year with a surplus of £2.1 million, which is due to primarily due to more than anticipated council tax income and an adjustment following the review of accounting provisions that Cabinet had approved some time ago. We are required to review and reassess the provisions that we hold at the 31st of March each year, and we reassess the financial provision for equal pay. And given that there are only a handful of claims to pay, and once we make a payment to HMRC for tax and national insurance, then we have calculated that around £750,000 is no longer needed for equal pay, and so also contributed to the £2.2 million surplus for the Council. The table at paragraph 9 sets out the annual budgets and the actual end of year figure, Figures and shows that in respect of service concessions, which is the adjustment for our PPP NDP schools that Council agreed in February, an additional £2 million has been added to the earlier figure of £16.717 million following the end of year taking, taking the total figure to £18.7 million. The additional £2 million has been added to the existing total, but members, you are aware that this additional amount is in excess of the £40 million you had set aside as part of the budget, and so the £2 million is, is a extra headroom for the year ahead. Paragraph 10 notes the transfers from um, Renewals and Repairs Fund during the year and sought approval from Cabin uh, Cabinet to add £700,000 to the fund to bring it back to previous levels. In addition, and following the reprofiling of the capital programme noted in the quarter three East Ayrshire Performance Report, approval was also sought to transfer the end of year underspend in debt charges to the capital fund, given that the underspend was as a result of timing and will be required for use in the years ahead. In terms of our services, you know that many had experienced significant pressures throughout the year, and while work was undertaken to reduce the level of in year variances, the consolidated year end overspend for our services is £11.4 million. And this will be carried forward as a first charge against services 24 25 budgets. Paragraph 14 provides details of the outturn for education and notes that an overspend of £3.5 million, with around half a million pounds due to early years and £3 million for ESN, with £2 million of this being due to transport costs and £1 million being additional staff costs as a result of increased pupil numbers. Members will be aware that reviews of early years in ASN to bring budgets back into line are in progress and will be reported to the members after recess. Within communities and economy, the combined services have an overspend of £1.5 million, predominantly due to waste, ending the year £1 million over budget, with facilities and property management and Ayrshire Roads Alliance in the year half a million pounds and £250,000 over budget, respectively. As members are aware, a presentation on options for waste collections was recently provided at a part, as part of a councillor conversation, with option 4C highlighted as potential delivery model. Colleagues um, in finance have spent the last few weeks reviewing the financial implications that flow from option 4C, and this work has concluded, which will facilitate the waste review report being presented after recess. 
Members will be aware of the significant financial um, and demands and pressures that impacted on health and social care last year, with the previous East Ayrshire Performance Report highlighting a financial pressure of £2.8 million. Unfortunately, due to a substantial increase in demand in the last quarter of the financial year, the service ended the year with an overspend of £6.6 .6 million, with the majority of this relating to community care, as the service supports care at home, continues to ensure we have no delayed discharges, and importantly, the service continues to meet all assessed care needs that exist in our communities. Given budgetary requirements of the IGIB, colleagues will look to use the IGIB uncommitted reserves to bring the end of year figure back into place. However, this will consume a significant level of reserves and therefore colleagues in health and social care are identifying options to deal with service demand and return the budget to a recurring balance position. Paragraph 23 provides detail of the Council's reserves and the service balances and commitments as at the 31st of March. The general fund on committed balance is um, £11.965 million, or just over 3% of the net revenue expenditure, with the total council reserves being £63 million. £32 million of this is service balances, which have been created in line with the council's reserve strategy and will be utilised by services at a later date. Paragraph 26 notes that the housing revenue account ended the year with a small surplus of £175,000, which has been generated from higher rent income, lower void property costs and reduced debt charges, with these offset by additional costs for estate maintenance and, and equipment and adaptations. The £175,000 surplus will require to be earmarked for the HRA and this will take the cumulative HRA balance to just over £23 million. Paragraph 27 sets out some of the capital programme work and notes that work continues on the Dunlop Early Childhood Centre project and that there has been some delay due to adverse weather, material supply issues and changes in design. Dunlop is the Council's first passive house certified building and there has been some delay due to the nature of the construction and design process. Costs are expected to exceed the tender value of two months. £0.9 million pounds by £312,000 and colleagues note that the additional cost can be contained within the funding envelope for the project. Paragraph 29 notes the work at On Thank Primary School supported learning centre and it is proposed that the works around changes to the external space, internal accommodation, toilet and changing areas are prioritised with the final scoping plans initiated to progress upgrades to the fencing and the internal configuration to increase toilet and changing facilities. At paragraph 30, we include the background to the Regulation of Investigatory Powers, Scotland Act 2000, and note that this refers to specific powers that permit the Council to make observations of a person in a covert manner, for example, without the person's consent, which could ordinarily constitute interference with the person's right to privacy. The Act provides a legal framework for public authorities and an inspection regime to monitor activities. In line with procedures devised by the Council, covert surveillance cannot take place without authorisation, and we use this end of year East Ayrshire performance report to provide detail of the number of authorisations that were sought between January 2023 to December 2023. And in line with previous years, the report notes that, there, that no authorisations were sought. Chair, the people, health and safety and risk management sections are covered in more detail in the accompanying report. Happy to stop there and take any initial questions on the content of the covering report before proceeding. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, for that. Um, Janie, this one goes back to you. The AS, the, the, the increase in the cost in the ASN. Do we anticipate that level of increase increasing going forward? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it, whilst that's not my area of, of responsibility um, within the education service, um, from an earlier perspective, we are seeing more and more children mm. um, attending our early childhood centres and funded providers and childminders who have either assessed additional support needs or potentially they will have additional support needs. So we are seeing an increase. So that increase will then be seen in primary and going on to secondary and obviously um, the increase for placements in terms of our special schools. So, yes, that, that is increasing. OK, thank you. So I, I guess the point I was trying to establish here is, is this a blip that we're trying to cover at the moment or is this going to be something that will be part we, we, we will have to um, plan for and that clearly is the case thank you for that can I open that up to the floor then please 
on what we've heard so far from Colin. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Richardson. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Sally. Um, just page 143.29, I just want to put on the record uh, basically gratitude to officers who um, took on board the the real imperative to treat the on thank uh, supported learning centre as a as an emergency really um and to make sure that those uh, changing uh, toilet facilities are going to be upgraded over the summer break um because it was really something that um it just couldn't be left any longer but when highlighted by uh, local members myself uh, uh Councillor Cowan and, and Councillor Mackay. Um, it's just great to see that um, the officers took on board the necessity to, to make that happen over the summer holidays so that when the kids go back, they've got, you know, facilities that are up to standard. So I just want to put that on the record. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Hogg. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just to go back to the point that you raised, and it's just a, a more of a, a kind of statement from my NHS work. We are seeing increasing numbers of children coming through um, with uh, an increase in diagnosis, um, which will impact on our services because we are seeing more support needed for additional needs. So I think our projection going forward will be that, that uh, more monies will have to be put into these services. Um, and then certainly um, every year we're seeing more and more uh, parents bringing children forward for diagnosis. So I do think that is going to be quite an area that we're going to have to look at. Thanks, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Hogg. Yes, I think it's something that we're all, all really quite worried about. Councillor Canning. Thanks, Chair. Um, so it's probably a question for, well, it is a question for Jenny. Um, I suppose two things. One, one is I just wanted actually to say about the Dunlop um, Early Learning Centre. I was lucky enough to have a, a, a tour of that. They were bearing the time capsule recently and it is a, it's a fabulous facility. So congratulations to everyone that's been involved in that. Um, the question really, or um, ask for Jane was the best value review Obviously, given the nature of what we're talking about and given the fact that we're the reason that it's happening, um, there's going to be some decisions that have a direct and impact on members. And I'm just conscious, uh, the reason I make the point is because we're obviously, if it's coming out in August, we're in recess. Can we just make sure that members are briefed so that sufficiently to understand the consequences for their own awards? Because Again, by the nature of what we're talking about and the direct, indirect consequences of some of these things, it's very emotive. And I think we just need to make sure that we're briefed ahead of time so that we're not getting, we know what, where we stand when we're getting, because there will be constituencies, um, constituents that are queries around that one in due course, I'm sure. Thank you, Jenny. Yep. Um, through you, Chair. Um, yes, the, the management actions or further management actions that we're having to take in 24. Um, 25, um, those settings that are affected directly, um, there have been meetings with staff, consultations with staff, and the wards um, affected, the elected members have been advised of that through briefing notes. So that information is out at the current time. So an elected member briefing, yes. yes. Yeah, the report's still to come out, so we don't know the results of the review yet, do we? Or Sorry. Through you, Chair. Um, in terms of the change in service delivery in three further establishments, that has been that is in progress, and elected members have been advised of that in terms of the wards that have been affected. The, the full best value review will look at a range of different things in terms of the delivery of funded early learning and childcare, including meals, cleaning, um, and lots of areas con concerned with that, and, and including the sustainable rate for funded providers. So um, we're not at that point yet of, of concluding that report, because as you'll appreciate, there's a lot of benchmarking that needs to take place. Um, a lot of um, views need to be collated. We've undertaken a parent consultation. We've undertaken a staff consultation. Um, we're benchmarking, as I said, with a number of local authorities in terms of different areas. We are consulting with our colleagues in um, 
facilities and property management. So there are a number of factors which will feature in the, the best value review, some of which we would be able to, um, I suppose, draw people's attention to prior to the report, but the, the report itself will address all these areas. Obviously, Thank before you. it goes into the public domain, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next section of the report, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, moving on to the main report, in relation to the main East Ayrshire performance report, the revenue section begins on page 147 and sets out the financial position for education, where we see underspends in primary and secondary schools, which due to DSM rules means that these will be earmarked and the underspend and pupil equity funding of 262,000 due to the timing of spend will also be earmarked. These together with the overspend in core budget means that the end of year position is three and a half million pounds overspend. Pressures on the core budget are in two parts, early years where there is an overspend of half a million and ASN teacher and transport costs of around three million. As mentioned previously, specific reviews on these two areas have been progressed by the head of education. Page 151 gives further detail on the position of communities and economy, and as stated a few moments ago, the pressures here are within waste management and also in facilities and property management. Within wellbeing, a main pressure point is within outward placements in children and families, but it's clear that community care is experiencing significant pressure, which has led this part of the service to overspend by £5.3 million, taking the total combined service spend overspend to 66 However, again, within community care, we continue to see zero delayed discharges and, importantly, all assessed care needs met. In line with the IGIB integration scheme, work will commence on identifying options that will bring the ongoing spending into line with the budgetary resources available. Pupil equity funding begins on page 157 and shows that the total pupil equity funding is £4.6 million for 23-24 and that £4.3 million has been either spent or committed as at the 31st of March, with around 260000 taken forward from now into June, which aligns, in, aligns to the academic rather than the financial year. The analysis shows that some head teachers and their teams have spent less within their allocation and at March, whereas a few have spent more um, PEF in 23-24 than their actual allocation, which demonstrates the financial planning that takes place with some schools spending in advance of grant and adjusting their next year's pupil equity funding. Alternative delivery models is on page 159 and shows that the Ayrshire Roads Alliance and East Ayrshire Leisure Trust detail. Ayrshire Roads Alliance ended the year with 773,000 underspent in strategic delivery due to vacancies and savings in pension costs, recharges, as well as some additional income. In East Ayrshire local delivery, we see an overspend of around 300,000 due to parking income shortfalls, additional overtime and street lighting costs. Ara Capital is also on this page, and we note that the um, Strathclyde Passenger Transport provided the additional funding of around £800,000 to support the conclusion of works at the bus station. And the report also notes the funding shortfall of around a million pounds for the new Cumberland Flood Prevention Scheme, although there is potential for contra the contractor to seek further costs. East Ayrshire Leisure Trust ended the year in a small underspend position, which will be taken to reserves. And although the surplus is only £14,000, the Trust had intended to draw £80,000 from reserves during the year as part of its financial plan. However, this was not needed. Members' Treasury begins on page 164. It shows that the total debt is around £461 million, the majority of it being with the Public Works Loan Board, and that at the date of the report, the Council has investments of around £13 million held with a variety of counterparties. The Capital Programme section begins on page 29, the People section on page 171, and the Health and Safety section on page 179. The Risk section begins on page 185. The Risks Management Strategy 24 to 27 was approved by the Governance and Scrutiny Committee on the 18th of April this year. This strategy will ensure that risk management is embedded into the culture of East Ayrshire Council through effective policy procedures and communications for the three year period up to the 31st of March 27. Going forward, the Council's Strategic Risk Officers Group will challenge, review, and update the Corporate Risk Register on a quarterly basis. This group has the responsibility of ensuring that emerging risks are identified and promoted, as well as ensuring that common risks within service risk registers are considered collectively. Chair, happy to stop there, noting that the recommendations approved by Cabinet are on page 136 at paragraph 3, and happy to take any questions.
Thank you. Thank you, Colin, for, um, very much. So any questions on the sections that uh, Colin has just reported on? Any questions online? No, no, no. no? OK, so if we. Oh, I'm so sorry, Councillor Richardson. Yep. No, it's fine, Sally. It was just a question. It was about the resurfacing. Um, just as a member of the public, it's it's always been noticeable that um, at certain times of the year, the the works on the roads it goes ballistic, and then other times of the year there doesn't seem to be anything happening. And it's just it's just really interesting to read that paragraph on page one six one, capital. Um, under resurfacing, 2023-2024, capital resurfacing programme was stopped to avoid an overspend with teams deployed to additional 400k revenue patching works as agreed by Cabinet, which is complete with full spend. All schemes not completed have been for, brought forward to, well, basically the new financial year. And it's just, um, I don't know. I'm not an accountant to trade, but... There, there must be a way of, you would think there would be a way of looking at what's going to be allocated resurfacing, you know, after the 7th of April, you know, the start of the new financial year. And, and basically you're sitting in February and March and no having just to bring everything to a stop. It just seems, it just seems crazy that it has to work that way. And as a driver and as a member of the public, it, everybody notices it because... All of a sudden, there are no roadworks going on. There's no resurfacing going on. Then, as soon as the the money's there and you're in the new financial year, every road in Kilmarnock seems to be getting dug up. It's just I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. I'm not an expert. I'm I'm no Joe McLaughlin. I'm not a, a, a an accountant accountant whiz. But that just seems to be crazy that it has to work that way. So it was just an Sally. It was just an observation. And, and, and Colin, you might be able to answer it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, it, obviously, in, in terms of the actual kind of operations off the roadside, and, and in terms of the, the, the timing of the works, that's that's not something I, I, I could specifically comment on. Um, obviously, just sort of kind of recognising that um, much of the road surface and work is covered from um, revenue resources um, and that does limit some of the timing in terms of when that can be done. Um, within capital resources, that tends to be a kind of longer term plan, which does allow some manoeuvrability there. Um, but obviously, in terms of the budget position, the, the road service um, was £250,000 in its entirety overspent. They have essentially been trying to manage that but ultimately much of that overspend was as a result of hitting the winter period and having to go out and actually do some works in terms of safety and requirements etc that, that's been done um, in terms of that um, but obviously on a financial basis we try to manage in terms of the resources and we do look at flexibilities where we can um, to ensure that operations continue as consistently over that period as it can rather than I know it can sometimes seem as if perhaps that's what's happening it's maybe perhaps grinding to halt but we do try and flatten that and that's why we do have um, and have in previous years we allow services that flexibility of carrying forward and potentially doing that for so for example roads are are overspent this year, they'll carry that forward because they have begun to take undertake works in terms of that so we do try and manage it as much as we can in terms of that. OK, OK, thank you very much. And uh, I think we're moving on to the capital programme, Simon. Over to Simon. Yep, yep, thank you. OK, thanks, Chair. Um, as members will be aware, the capital programme update was presented to Cabinet um, on the 29th of May, and um, that noted the significant financial challenges to affordability around high construction costs and, and high interest rates. That, that has required a detailed line-by-line -line review of all the projects, both in terms of scope and phasing to bring the programme back within agreed borrowing limits, and the programme will continue to be closely monitored going forward. Conscious that there's been a, a number of reports considered this morning, so I don't propose to go through the individual projects in, in the main report, but happy to answer any specific questions that members may have. Thanks, Chair. Are there any questions on the capital programme? No, no, thank you very much. So 
moving on to people. Amanda, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Morning, members. Um, like Simon, I only intend to highlight a few um, points in the people pages and then I'll happy to pause to take any questions. So the people pages start in mean, the summary report on page 171 with the absence statistics starting on page 172. Noting that there's an equivalent of 4,283 employees absent, which is an increase in 130 employees in the same period last year, but noting a de decrease in the number of days lost of 743, which results in a decrease of 0.47 work days lost. Also note in tables two and three, the numbers are slightly different for the employees, and that's based on some employees are off multiple times during the period. The top five reasons um, for absence this year compared to last year, the top four remain exactly the same, with the fifth period, fifth reason last year being coronavirus and this year being colds and flus. Short-term absence um, has worked out as an equivalent of 9.47 days lost per employee, compared to, which compares to last year gives a slight decrease of 0.12. And long-term absence is 4.43 workdays lost per employee compared to the same period last year gives us a decrease of 0.49. As advised members previously, we took a paper to Cabinet last August, which set out a number of actions which are now all in place. And the plan is to go back to Cabinet in August, September time with an update on all those actions and um, recommending further um, actions to take forward to try and improve the attendance, sport and attendance position. The occupational health activities in page 173, there's an increase in occupational health appointments in the same period last year of 270, early interventions of 370, and it's sorry, early interventions increase of 45, and an increase um, in physio appointments of 66. Page 174, you also know that the head count of the council for the same period of last year is increased by 23, but it's a decrease in five from the last quarter. And on page 175, members will see the breakdown of the Jobs and Training Fund. Within the council, we've recruited 140 people to a number. The number has decreased from previous quarter by 12, but this is a positive as the, um, these 12 have gained employment either within East Ayrshire Council or out with. For the period 24-25, we've received requests for 37 apprentices, four interns. Um, sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Apologies. We also have, in addition to the 140, 37 apprentices and four interns in local businesses. For 24-25, we've received requests for 28 apprentices, two graduate apprentices and 10 graduate interns, which would exceed our target of 200 to by 21, taking us to 221 in total. Recruitment update is at the bottom of page 175. We still continue to have difficulty to fill some posts and we continue to work with the services, imaginative ways and how we can do that. And a lot of that's uh, wrapped around succession planning with bringing in trainees and apprentices and training them um, up to qualified levels. Page 176 notes the levers um, for the council have been 120 in total. The main categories for that are 29 in retirement, 68 resignations and 12 at the end of temporary contracts. The payroll activity is detailed in 176, noting that there's an increase of 486 uh, terminations compared to the period last year. I've mentioned before that was due to the um, work that was done with the bank post to do a bit of cleansing to the system. Communications overviews in 177, highlighting the activities and campaigns and also noting our accessibility journey, which continues at pace. Key performance indicators for OD is in page 177 and 178, which provides members with details of the online induction module, leadership programmes, mentoring framework and face time engagement, which excludes teaching staff. And I'll pause there and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda, and look, uh, looking forward to the um, report in August about absence. Thank you. And I'll open that up to the floor. Any questions? No, 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 goodness, you've got away lightly. Um, and now moving on to health and safety. Jane, Jane, thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Um, if I could begin by drawing members' attention to the top of page 180 of the summary report, the number of non-reportable incidents reported to the Health and Safety Section has increased by 669 in comparison to last year, while the incidents reportable to the Health and Safety Executive have decreased by six. The increase in the non-reportable incidents is mainly due to an increase in violence and aggression reporting within educational establishments. And as reported previously to Cabinet, this has mainly been driven by incidents involving staff directly engaged in the support of young people with dysregulated behaviours. Incidents under this category account for 68% of all incidents reported to the health and safety team and work is ongoing in collaboration with educational colleagues and their trade unions to implement practical control measures to reduce this number. Looking at health and safety in general terms, um, we have placed a focus this year on reducing the risks from physical hazards, including dust, vibration and noise. We will again be supporting housing asset services later this year with our annual WorkSafe training programme. And this month, we will also be supporting Ayrshire Roads Alliance in launching their WorkSafe training programme, where we will train staff in safety topics, including working at height, manual handling, vibration and dust. We'll also be working this month in collaboration with our colleagues in cleansing and our comms team, along with our partners in the fire service, to create an awareness campaign around the dangers of lithium ion batteries in the waste industry. Members will be aware of the fire last month at the Western Road Depot and also the fire at the battery store in Cowinning in April this year, which caused extensive damage. Nationally, there were 1,200 lithium ion battery fires in bin lorries and waste sites last year, which is an increase of 71% from 2022. So this joint promotional campaign will therefore seek to raise awareness of the public to the dangers these batteries present once in the waste stream and provide advice on safe routes of disposal. And that concludes our report, Chair, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I'm, I would imagine we're all slightly concerned about the number of violence and aggression incidents within our educational establishments. Um, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit more about what we're what we're doing about that. Then I know you've you've referred to the the, the trade unions and education getting involved, but perhaps you could tell us what we're actually doing. Thank you. Of course, there's um, we have got various working groups um, that are ongoing at the moment with educational establishments, um, with um, our trade unions, our health and safety advisors um, provide one-to-one -one support with all our establishments. So every violence and aggression incident that comes through the She Assure system um, um, is audited um, at at source. And then what, what we do is um, at the end of every month, then we do um, deep dive reports and analysis into any specific trends. Um, and then what we do is we then go out then and support then the heads of centres or the head teachers and everything then to, to provide additional support. Um, what I, what I would, look, would like to point out to, to members is that although that there is a, an increase here, um, it sometimes it doesn't tell the full story. Um, I just recently done um, completed an analysis on um, the incidents of violence and aggression. Sometimes we get hotspots at certain establishments, depending on the the mix of um, pupils at, at the time. But any time that we do have any kind of hotspots, um, what we have seen is a, an awful lot of good news stories that we have managed then to mitigate and to, to help and support. Um, so sometimes I think it's that the, the numbers in isolation don't really tell the full story of the the good work that we're all doing um, doing together. So it's, it's a very difficult, challenging, uh, long-term subject um, to, to, try and, to try and do. But I think we are starting to make inroads into training, awareness, further supports, um, 
and the health and safety advisors are, are, are definitely they're very, very knowledgeable and they're, they're all, all the time supporting. Thank you very much. That's extremely reassuring. And can I open that up to the floor, please? Any other questions? Any other questions online? Just, well, just one more thing from me then. As far as the lithium batteries are concerned, um, I'm conscious that the volume of batteries that need recycling is relatively low in terms of our recycling stats. So it perhaps does it perhaps gets a disproportionately small amount of time allocated to it or resource allocated to recycling something that I don't know whether or not we, we need to be reassessing that. I'd be interested in your, your thoughts. No, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's more about raising awareness because I think an awful lot of people, especially with the increase of um, vapes, for you know, for for example, um, and the disposable of disposal of batteries. Even this, you know, speaking to my team when this all happened, um, much younger uh, employees had no idea that you couldn't just throw your your batteries in the bin. Um, and there's very few of us that were aware that there was already an established process in place to dispose of batteries through the waste collection, and you just put a bag on top of your um, your bin, and they, they they can collect that. So I think probably, although that's saying it's an increase of 71%, sometimes the increase can look larger because it's a very small small amount. Um, but I think it's more about just raising the awareness then and probably raising the awareness within our staff groups, you know, at, at waste as well, just to make sure then that we're mo monitoring things. Thank you very much. Now, I'm sure I'm sure you're absolutely right. It is a question of raising a, a, a awareness. Any more questions? Any more questions? No, no. And so we are now on to complaints. No, no, complaints. Thank well, you. There's simply there. Uh, I'm not in a position to speak in any detail. Apologies. Uh, but if there are any issues arising in relation to the information provided in the complaints, we'll be happy to, to take them away and provide any answers or provide them now if we can. But uh, they're simply there for noting in terms of the numbers in the reporting period for quarter four and 23-24. Um, take any issues, but I don't know that there's any major matters of concern. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, David. And um, the final section, of course, is risks, which we've already dealt with um, at a previous meeting. So um, I, the, the recommendations uh, are, of course, approved. So I think unless anybody has anything else to say, I think that brings the meeting to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody online. Nice to see you.